With the time we have, um, I've taken the liberty of departing from whatever the scheduled topic was, which I looked at and I thought for most of you might be boring. I thought what we really ought to talk about is what everybody's talking about. How many of you heard about stem cells lately? How many have heard about cloning lately? What's that got to do with the Bible? You say, is there, is there genetic manipulation in the Bible? Yes. In fact, you will not understand most of the Old Testament unless you really understand who the Rephaim really were. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So we're going to explore the biotech revolution. I like to call it the new sorcerer's apprentice. And where are we going? Well, there appear to be long-sought remedies emerging for many of the diseases that have been most elusive in our society in all kinds. Um, in fact, there are astonishing advances that are emerging in molecular biology, including, of course, the ultimate one is cloning. The idea that we'll actually be able to clone human beings, you've got to be kidding. No, the serious scientists are expecting to do that within a year or two. In fact, there are articles that they're expecting cloning baby factories and so forth. Uh, this is not fringe stuff. This is centerline uh, weirdness. Um, now, when you start seeing them growing human ears on mice, you ought to get uncomfortable because uh, there are some very serious concerns emerging by those that are best informed in terms of cross-species diseases and the rest. But there's also, we believe, some biblically relevant implications on the horizon. Our agenda will be briefly to look at this, first of all, uh, in terms of a panacea. We'll talk about the tissues. We'll do just a quick tutorial on the human cell and uh, some of that and the code of life, because I think there's some tremendous lessons for us all there. But then we'll also talk not just about the tissues, but the issues what we're concerned about. We'll talk about what I'll call the dark side. Have we really opened a Pandora's box? We're tampering with the engines of creation. What are the prophetic implications of that? Now, the reason I call a source's apprentice, most of you are familiar with the Desarbling uh, Magic Student thing by von Goethe that was made into a musical piece by Paul Dukas in 1897 called The Sorcerer's Apprentice, which was, of course, popularized in Walt Disney's Fantasia. That's why I use it as a as a, a frame of reference for us, because you may recall the whole idea of that piece of literature was that a student so, uh, uh, created a spell uh, and didn't get it quite correct. He unleashed forces that be, was, were uncontrollable, and his teacher finally had to intervene to terminate the impending disaster. That's basically the theme that w uh, occupies that music, but it's also exactly what seems to be going on here. We're starting to tamper with things that are out of our control, and it's going to take our designer's intervention to straighten the mess that we have out. If we were going to map a perspective of our physical reality, starting with the human body, which of course is composed of organs, the organs are composed of tissues, the tissues of cells. Within the cells, that's what I want to focus on a little bit, we have a miniature city full of molecular robots. And so below that atomic structure, some atomic particles, and we finally get to the boundaries of reality itself as we discover that subatomic particles have no, ro no locality. We'll talk a little bit about that. But the cells and these molecular robots are something that we each need to be a little bit more aware of. So I'd like to talk briefly about um, what I call a constellation of miracles the miniature city that we call the cell. Now, Michael Denton summarized this very well in his work back in 1986. He says, although the tiniest bacterial cells, although they're incredibly small, each is in effect a veritable micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery made up of a hundred billion atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. The simple cell, all of us, in school, probably saw a textbook that had a little diagram of what they call the simple cell. It turns out there isn't such an animal. The simplest cell is more complicated, it's beyond our imagining. It, is, has, it has a central memory bank, it has assembly plants and processing units, it has repackaging and shipping centers, robot machines in the form of protein molecules that consist typically of 3,000 atoms in three-dimensional configurations and there's hundreds of thousands of different kinds of these machines that make up the, po the composite. And they communicate with elaborate communication systems that we have yet to understand. And they also have quality control and error correcting mechanisms. Now, if we were going to make a model of a simple cell, let's assume we decided to embark on a project to build a model of a cell 1,000 million times larger than life. 
Well, that would make each atom about the size of a tennis ball. We would need 10 million million atoms, about 10 to the 13th. That's quite a number. If you, ha if you had to count them at one per minute, it would take you 19 million years to count them. That's a lot. And this model that we would make would be over 10 miles in diameter. You get a feeling that this thing is big and complicated? Absolutely. Now we speak of the cell, we glibly make little diagrams saying that, well, it's surrounded by a plasma membrane. What we fail to realize is that in that membrane are gateways with special signal receptors and security guards to monitor what goes in and goes out. The center of the cytoplasm, of course, has as it, it, the core, it's its nucleus, which is its information center, which includes a master library with which everything uh, is coordinated. Inside that, we have automated factories and product manufacturing facilities. All this is powered by power stations. The mitochondrions are power plants and the energy sources for this miniature city. And they have a, uh, a bunch of things they call the Golgi apparatus that process, package, uh, ship, and pre prepare for export the various products. And they also have vesicules which uh, transport and take care of trash disposal and all that sort of thing. Now, we have rope, this thing is populated with robot machines in hundreds of thousands of different types, as I said, and they communicate by means of digital languages and decoding systems. Memory banks for information storage and control systems for regulating all this and indulges in prefabrication and modular construction. It has proofreading and error correction devices for quality control. Now, as some of you know, I spent six years of my executive career at the Ford Motor Company. In, at Ford, we were very proud of our very unique facility in Dearborn called the Ford River Rouge uh, plant. Now, this is a plant that's the largest integrated ma manufacturing facility in the world. It has about 100 miles of railroad within the plant. Under one roof, they receive raw limestone, raw iron ore, and coal go in one end. They manufacture under that roof their own steel, their own glass, their own paint, they have an automated plant that builds the engines. They have a manufacturing line for all the rest. They assemble the mixed models, different cars of different kinds of different colors, as you all know. And anyway, the point, the raw materials go in one end, new cars come out the other. It's, a, it's considered the largest integrated manufacturing facility in the world. The reason I bring it up is the cell, your simplest cell, is more complicated than the River Rouge plant. And your cell can do something the River Rouge plant can't do. It is capable of replicating its entire self within a few hours. And by the way, all cells derive from previous cells. We know of no case where a cell comes from a startup. All cells derive from a prior cell. Think about that. Now, there's a choreography that I can't resist including in this briefing to give you a flavor of what goes on every hour or two in every cell of your body. And that's a choreography that's absolutely breathtaking. Uh, the choreography of the chromosomes. Mitosis is the splitting of the nucleus, uh, cytokinesis is the splitting of the cell itself. And what you have in the cell is the, all the chromosomes condense and the, the nucleus will dissolve. Then a strange mitotic spindle starts to form. Now you ask yourself, who's orchestrating this? Nobody knows. How do they all know that they stop what they're doing and prepare for this dance that's going to go on? The mitotic spindle starts to form. The, all the chromosomes have duplicated themselves into pairs and await the rest of the dance. And we'll go into the next phase, the metaphase. As this mitotic spindle, notice they don't connect. They, each mitotic spindle knows exactly where it is to, supposed to connect on one of the uh, kinetochores of the uh, chromosomes. The question is, gee, how do they know where to go? How can they see where they're supposed to go? Who's coordinating all this? Nobody knows. This whole dance, which is essential to life, of course got all designed by chance. This is all the result of a random accident. But I want you to notice that this metodic spindle finds its location when it finally gets connected to all of these various chromosome pairs. We're ready for the next phase. And I'll take the next two phases together to save time. What happens now, you notice the nuclei have dissolved. How does it know that these, these, these miniature cities have, res, have decided to dissolve? The, the mitotic spindle pulls apart these pairs.